Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on RealLibertyMedia.com and RLMRadio.xyz. Oh, yeah, kids, how the hell y'all doing out there? This is Grimnir. This is the Grim Leftovers program. It is a Monday evening. This is episode 75 of the Grim Leftovers show. And uh, it's, uh, what day is today? June 8, 2020. June 8, 2020. All right, so uh, we got a bunch of stories all lined up here for you, as we do on this program. We. I say we. It's just me. I don't know why I'm saying we. I guess there's, you know, I've got multiple personalities or something. Eh, yeah, you never know. <laughs> anyway, welcome to everybody out there in the various places you may be tuned in from, whether that's on Real Liberty Media.com, reallibertymedia.com, rlmradio.xyz, realliberty.org, tunein.com, or wherever else the chat, I mean, the uh, st- audio stream may be going. Oh, my brain, my brain, what's going on here? I'm thinking of words that are mixing up with other words. I, I don't get it. I walked outside just a little while ago out here uh, in uh, downtown Moriarty, New Mexico, in the wind, the wind be howling out there. The dust be blowing. I felt like I was I was in the middle of Joe Bonamassa's song, Dust Bowl. Live it in a dust bowl. <laughs> anyway, if you're not over here on com, jump on over and get into the chat, and you can chat with all the fine folks that we got here tonight. We got a, we got a, we got a good group of folks here today. Oh uh, well, yeah, we're uh, yeah. It's 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 almost standing room only. You may be able to find a table somewhere, or maybe there's a seat up there at the bar. Anyway, come on in, pull up a chair, and uh, say hi and howdy to all the folks we got here with us tonight. I'm looking in the chat. I'm just going to tell you the people that are actively chatting here or just joined. We got the sock puppet and the lone frog. I am lone frog, not I am. He is lone frog. We got Mister Meister Brow Woodman. If you will, Rob works in the mighty bubbler. Hey, thanks for that, Rob. Uh, we got Miss Christine here. Hey, Christine. Chloe, and I, I know Moose Girl's here. She's uh, setting up her new VPN, so that's always cool. Uh, I, I know Kate's around somewhere. At least I assume she is. And Vinny, Uncle Vinny. Oh, not Uncle. He's I'm Big Papa, so he'd have to be Son Vinny. No, he's Brother Vinny. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. Matt W J there. 2002, uh, I, I saw I saw other folks in here chatting it up earlier. Uh, yeah, we got Dullard, Dullard, uh, Circle is probably asleep. Uh, Anti, you out there with us? Hey, Kate, how are you? Um, and uh, I, I don't know, Rome's, are you awake? Trust the one? Yeah, there you go, SLC Mike. Hey, Mike. Uh, yeah, and uh, just a whole bunch of other folks. There's all kinds of folks in here uh, in, joining us for the uh, program here tonight. So hopefully uh, you'll you'll be with us. But like I said, I got a whole bunch of stories all lined up here for you. I might, I might as well start getting on to uh, to them. Any predictions? Oh, I got all kinds of predictions. But yeah, do you really want to hear them? Probably not. <laughs> don't forget the Karens. Well, I don't, we don't have any Karens in here. There are no Karens. Well. Rome's is, you know, maybe, but maybe not. I think he's learned some stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like Rome's. Rome's is my buddy. Uh, don't mess with Rome's. All right, so here we go. We're going to kick it off on the offguardian.org. Uh, Hans is, uh, well, he's something different. He, he's something different totally. Uh, anyway, back to my stories here. On the offguardian.org site, on uh, April 23rd, uh, this was posted, the seven-step path from pandemic to totalitarianism. I don't even know if there's seven steps, but they say there are, so they say there are just seven steps from pandemic declaration to permanent totalitarianism. And uh, many jurisdictions are about to step, start step five. They they may be, well, this was April 23rd, so uh, they're probably well into that. As if it was planned in advance, 
billions of people around the globe are being forced step by rapid step into a radically different way of life, one that involves far less personal, physical, and financial freedom and agency. Here's the template for rolling this out. Step one, create a new virus and use that virus as it starts to spread around the world. The World Health Organization goes ahead and declares it a pandemic. International agencies, public health officials, politicians, media, and other influential voices uh, fan the fear by focusing almost exclusively on the contagiousness of this fake virus and the rising number of cases, and by characterizing the virus as extremely dangerous. Yes, that's right. There's a monster under your bed. Within a few days, governments at the national and local levels also declare states of emergency. At lightning speed, they impose lockdown measures that confine most people to their homes, starting with closing schools, which was really, a, that's, a, that's a positive, that's a good thing. Closing schools is a huge benefit to society in general. Closing government schools, I should say. And shut down much of the global economy. World markets implode. The stunned, fearful, incredulous public convinced over the previous few years that their bodies do not have the natural ability to react to pathogens by producing their own antibodies uh, that confer long-lasting immunity largely complies very willingly. The first weekly uh, virtual class on local emergency and crisis responses to corona is held for mayors and other city officials around the world, coordinated by a handful of American organizations in the academic, medical, financial, political, and transportation spheres. The classes feature guests rain ranging from, this is a short range, but ranging from Barack Obama to Bill Gates. Oh, yeah, that's quite the range you got there. Step two, national, state, provincial, and municipal leaders, as well as public health officials, uh, start d daily press briefings. They use them to pump out frightening statistics and modeling asserting that the virus has the potential to kill many millions. Most of this information is hard to decipher and sheds little real light on the natural course of the virus spread through each geographic area. Officials and media downplay or distort inconveniently low death tolls from the virus and instead focus on alarming statistics produced by compliant academics social media influencers, and high-profile organizations. Yes, we don't want to know about low death tolls. No, no, don't talk about that. The main message is that this is a war, and many lives are at stake unless virtually everybody stays at home. Mainstream media amplify the trope that the world is at the mystery of this I mean, the mercy of this mystery virus. The mystery of this mercy virus? Anyway, simultaneously, central banks and governments hand out massive amounts of cash, largely to the benefits of the big banks. And they bring in giant private sector financial firms to manage the process, despite these global companies' very, very poor track record, in the 2008-2009 crash, governments also rapidly start to create trillions of pounds worth of programs that include compensating businesses and workers for their shutdown-related losses. Step 3. There is a concerted effort by all levels of government and public health to rapidly ramp up testing for viral RNA. 
Yeah, that's stuff that makes you up. Uh, along with production of personal protective equipment, protective equipment, they push aside the need for regulation, including quality standards and independent verification of tests, uh, rates of accuracy, by insisting that fast approval and rollout are imperative for saving lives that aren't dying in the first place. Uh, models are released that predict snowballing of numbers of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, even under the best case scenarios. At about the same time, public health officials significantly loosen the criteria for viral infections. They loosen the criteria for viral infections. Huh. Outbreaks and deaths, particularly in the oldest members of society, that increases the number of cases and deaths ascribed to the new pathogen. Now, anybody that dies has died of corona. The media continue to clamor for more testing and for severe punishment of people that are not completely compliant with the lockdown measures. Hmm, not completely compliant was the message about a month, month and a half ago. Now the message is, kneel, assume the position, get on your knees. But that's another story. <laughs> as a result, there's little backlash as police and military, with sweeping new powers, enforce these measures and give stiff penalties or even jail terms or kill uh, those who dis disobey orders. States also monitor with impunity massive numbers of people's movements via their cell phones. Vast human resources are focused on tracking down people who have had contact with a virus-positive individual and confining them to their homes. Thus, the portion of the public exposed to the virus remains relatively small. It also contributes to social isolation. Among many effects, this enables those in control to even further erase the individual collective choices, uh, choices, voices, and power. Wow. How about all that? Step four. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. Step closer to now. Uh, when the numbers of cases and deaths start to plateau, local officials claim it's too early to tell whether the virus has finished passing through the population and therefore restrictive measures must continue. Restrictive measures. Home imprisonment must continue. An alternative narrative is that if such measures are not kept in place, there will be a resurgence, a second wave of cases and deaths. Yet another is that the continuing climb in elderly persons' deaths means all bets are off for the time being. Uh, they admit that the initial models incorrectly predicted that there would be a tsunami of cases, ICU admissions, and deaths. However, they assert more time is needed before it can be determined whether it's safe to loosen some of the restrictions and let their children return to school. Don't send your kids back to those schools. Those schools are nasty, and they're, they're just propaganda and indoctrination. You don't, you don't want that. And to allow, allow adults to go back to work. Officials do not try to calculate the overall skyrocketing cost to their populations and economies of the shutdowns and other measures against, nor do they discuss what cost level may be too high, because they have no clue. And, well, it's all part of the, the bigger, the overall agenda, which I don't believe they discuss here. Uh, but that overall agenda is to uh, modify the global economic system in such a way as it's totally unrecognizable from what it was last December, say, uh, because the new global economic system will not be dollar-based. It will not be oil-based. It will all be digital. There will be no more cash. 
you will accept. <laughs> well, let's just call it the mark. <laughs> if you want to buy or sell in this society. All right. Meanwhile, new data are published showing the virus has a high capacity to mutate. Uh, more misinformation. Scientists and officials interpret this as meaning a larger medical arsenal will be needed to combat it. Step five. This is where this was those weeks ago, April 23rd, when this article was published. About two or three weeks later, a dramatic increase in testing for viral RNA produces the desired goal of a significant upsurge in the number of people found positive for the virus. Well, we weren't testing anybody, and there weren't a lot of people. We didn't find a lot of people infected. We started testing a bunch of people, and we've widened the scope of, of what it means to be infected. And now a bunch of people show as being infected. Yeah, there's still not many people dying, but you know... <laughs> But we're going to increase the people, the number of people dying by saying these people over here that got shot in the head over there in Chicago, that that was coronavirus-related. <laughs> Public health officials add jet fuel to the surge. And by the way, jet fuel does not melt steel beams. So adding jet fuel to the surge by adding to their case and death tallies in large numbers of people who are only suspected and not lab test confirmed to have had an infection. Politicians and public health officials tell the populace this means they cannot return to their jobs or other activities outside the home for the time being. Uh, governments work with public health agencies, academics, industry, the WHO, and other organizations to start to design and implement Immunity passport systems for using the results of the widespread antibody testing to determine who can be released from lockdown. This is one of many goals of the seven steps. Meanwhile, government leaders continue to highlight the importance of vaccines for besting the virus. Step Bodies, antibodies, body, body, bodies. Step six, now coming your way. Large-scale human testing of many different types of antivirals and vaccines begin. This is in process. You may, you may have heard all the news that this is in process. They're doing rapid wide-scale testing, human testing of antivirals and vaccines. Thanks to a concerted push from the WHO, Bill Gates and his collaborators, pharmaceutical and biotech companies, governments, and universities, large swaths of population do not have the antibodies to this virus because you've been locked in your homes and therefore not exposed. They eagerly accept these medications, even though they've been rushed to market with inadequate safety testing. So be ready for that. Untested poisons being pumped into your veins. They believe these medical products offer the only hope. <laughs> Help me, Obi-Wan. You're my only hope. Uh, for, <laughs> for escaping the virus's clutches. Step seven. Soon. The new virus starts another cycle around the globe, just as influenza and other viruses have every year for forever. Officials again fan the flames of fear by positing the potential for millions of deaths among people not yet protected, uh, protected from the virus. They rapidly roll out virus and antibody testing again, while companies sell billions more doses of their antivirals and booster vaccines. Governments simultaneously cede control of all remaining public assets to global companies. This is a very important line. A very important line. Governments simultaneously cede control of all remaining public assets to global companies. 
Now, earlier, just before the show in the chat, somebody asked me, any predictions? There you go. There's your prediction. <laughs> and this is because local and national government's tax bases were decimated during step one, the lockdown, the shutdown of everything business-related, and they're virtually bankrupt from their unprecedented spending in the war against the virus in the other steps. <sighs> the overall result is complete medicalization of the response to the virus, which on a population level is no more harmful than any flu. This is coupled with the creation of permanent totalitarianism controlled by global companies, absolute fascism, well, that's what that is, by the way, that's absolute fascism, totalitarianism controlled by global, global companies, and a 24-7 invasive surveillance police state supported by the widespread blossoming of smart technology. The key players repeat the cycle of hysteria and massive administration of antivirals and booster shots every few months. And they implement a variation of steps one through seven when another new pathogen appears on the planet. Oh, baby, it be coming. And uh, since it worked so well the first time, why not? With the arrival of COVID-19, <laughs> you call it that, do you? Many countries quickly completed steps one, two, and three. Step four, at that point, is well underway. Step five is on track to start in early May, and it did. And we are uh, into step six now in June here. So uh, th th this, this, this is uh, this is this man. This is this. It's it's ridiculous. It's redonkulous. It's 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 totally insane. But that's where we are. Now another article from the Off Guardian here by uh, Ian Davis on May fifth. COVID nineteen is a statistical nonsense. Nonsense, I say. <laughs> the mortality statistics for COVID-19 have been incessantly hammered into our heads by the mainstream media, the CLAP. They call it the MSM here, but it's the CLAP, the Corporate LMS Propaganda. Every day, they report these hardest of facts to justify the lockdown house arrest and to prove to us that living in abject fear of corona syndrome is the only sensible reaction. Apparently, the most lucrative vaccine ever devised can possibly save us. Oh, the most lucrative, not the most effective. No, the most lucrative vaccine ever devised. That's the only thing that could save us. Corona mortality statistics are the reason millions will undoubtedly download the contract tracing state surveillance apps. This will help <laughs> help the vaccinated to secure their very own immunity passports. Immunity passports. Oh, you got your immunity passport? Your identity papers? Show me your papers. Oh, you cannot pass. You cannot purchase without your immunity papers and enable them to prove they are allowed to exist in the post-corona society whenever the state demands to see their authorization. But how reliable, how reliable, I ask, are these statistics? Well, as was stated, I think it was, it might have been Mark Twain, who said there are three kinds of liars. Liars, damn liars, in statisticians. Could have been somebody else. That, that, that might have been uh, uh, that circus dude, uh, P.T. Barnum. It might have been P.T. Barnum. I don't know. It might have been, uh, might have been Twain. I forget. Anyway, somebody said that, and they were right. <laughs> what do they really tell us about what is happening outside of the confines of our incarceration? Do they reveal the harsh reality of the unprecedented deadly virus sweeping the nation and the world, or does the story of how they have been manipulated, inflated, 
fudged and exploited tell us something else. The once reliable Office of National Statistics, they were never reliable. It's just you tended to believe them a little more. In order to register a death in England and Wales, under normal circumstances, a qualified doctor needs to record the cause of death on the medical certificate of cause of death, the MCCD. Neat, huh? Uh, they must notify the medical examiner for corroborating opinion, providing the doctor is clear on the cause of death and no irregularities or suspicions are noted. If the medical examiner concurs, there's no need to refer to the death, uh, the, the death to a coroner. The second opinion of the medical examiner, another qualified doctor, was introduced in 2016 following a series of high-profile systemic abuses. The mass murder of Dr. Harold Shipman and doctors at Mid-Staffordshire NHS Foundation, you might notice this is all British, um, and Southern Health NHS Trust covered up crimes and widespread malpractice by improperly completing the MCCDs. Today, once the medical examiner agrees, they then discuss the death with a qualified informant. This is usually someone who knows the deceased. It is an opportunity, more often than not, for a family member or friend to discuss any concerns they, about the suggested cause of death. If no further issues are raised, the death certificate can be issued to the informant, the local registrar notified, and the death recorded. Recorded deaths have been recorded in England, registered deaths have been recorded in England and Wales since 1837. From 1911 onward, the cause of death has been coded in accordance with the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD. Uh, maintaining registration records was respons the responsibility of the General Register Office until 1970, when it became a department of the Office of Population Censuses and Surveys, the OPCS. They love their acronyms. In 1996, the OPCS merged with the Central Statistic Office, the CSO, and the Office of National Statistics, the ONS. There have been some tweaks and legislative changes to the system over the years. The, the, the technology has sped things up a bit, but essentially the simple process of recording registered deaths has changed little over the last century. The ONS have been accurately, whatever, recording registered deaths in England and Wales for more than 23 years. From a statistical perspective, da 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 da. Oh, all right, let me try. This is a really long article. Um, so, so anyway, get that getting down here to uh, impacting the COVID-19 st statistics. This quite bizarre death registration process compelled the ONS to issue guidance to doctors signing the MCCDs. Not only is there no need for examination, no need for examination, to pronounce deaths from corona, nor is there any necessity for a positive test or even an indicative CT scan. They, they don't have to test positive. Uh, there's no examination required. Uh, there, there's, you, you don't really even have to look at the person to say, hey, they died of corona. What? <laughs> that's, the, that's the new method. That's the way this works now. In their guidance, the ONS advised doctors on what constitutes an acceptable underlying cause of death. When mortality statistics are used for research, it's usually the most relevant factor. The vast majority of corona deaths reported by the state and the MSM, or the CLAP, also reflect its identification as the underlying cause. The WHO defines this as the disease or injury which initiated the train of morbid events leading to death. For corona, this determination can be based upon the clinical judgment of a doctor who has never seen or met the deceased, quite possibly following nothing more than a video link consultation or a case note review of symptoms. 
holy cow. Holy mad cow, since it's coming from England. <laughs> anyway, statistically, it gets worse. The overwhelming majority of medical and care staff, coroners, pathologists, ONS statisticians, and funeral directors have no desire, zero, to mislead anyone. However, in the case of corona deaths, the state has created a registration system so ambiguous it is virtually useless. Oh, it's beyond virtually useless. It's absolutely freaking lootly useless. The statistical product recorded by the ONS, despite their best efforts, is correspondingly vacuous. That has not stopped the state and the CLAP from reporting every death as proof of the deadliness of corona. Claims of corona as the underlying cause of death should be treated with considerable skepticism. There's a ton more in the article, and hopefully you'll go back and read this article. The, the link, the link, the link will be in the post-show blog, but there it is for you. Uh, Grimm's Commentary Rules. <laughs> All right, moving on, moving on. Uh, but uh, thank you to OffGuardian.org for all of that. Now, by this point in time, you're all well aware, well aware of the contact tracing applications that are out there. The fact that they are hiring thousands upon thousands of people to be contact tracers to walk around to your homes and make sure that you're, that you're okay, that you're all right. But they swear, they promise you that all that information collected on you by them with these contact tracing apps is only for that one-time use and, and uh, there, no personally identifiable information will be out there and available uh, to the general people they share it with, so, which is a lot of people, until May 4th, 2020. <laughs> Posted on TheRegister.com. UK COVID-19 contract eight tracing app data may, <laughs> will be kept for, quote, research, unquote, after the phony crisis ends, MPs are told. Hey, I don't want my data. I want to opt out of that part. No chance in hell, says the NHS X chief <laughs> Britons will not be able to ask the NHS admins to delete their COVID-19 contact tracing data from government servers. The digital arm NHS X's chief exec Matthew Gould admitted to the MPs this afternoon. Gould also told Parliament Human Rights Committee, they really have that? Uh, that data harvested from Britain through NHSX COVID-19 contact tracing app will be pseudonymized, pseudonymized, and appear to leave the door open for that data to be sold for research. Sold! The government's contact tracing app will be rolled out on Britain this week, which was several weeks ago, therefore it's already there. A demo seen by the register showed its basic consumer-facing functions, uh, key to those uh, big green button that users press to send 28 days worth of contact data. Yeah, just send all my contact data over to the government. I trust them. <laughs> and there's a little screenshot of like a phone or something. It says, your symptoms indicate you may have coronavirus. What? What, what, read what to do next? Ugh. So written by the tech arm at NHSX, uh, Britain's contact tracing app breaks with international convention by opting for a centralized model of data collection. All the contract tracing data is kept under one roof in one central government database. But don't worry, nobody ever hacks into date. Never mind. 
In response to questions from the Scottish Nationalist MP Joanna Cherry this afternoon, Gould told MPs, the data can be deleted for as long as it's on your own device. However, once you upload all the data, that will be deleted. Uh, once you upload all the del all the data, will be deleted or fully anonymized with the law, so it can be used for research purposes. Don't you believe it for a second? It will not be anonymized, and it will not be deleted, and it will be used for research purposes, and sales purposes, and all kinds of other nasty purposes. Uh, <laughs> De-anonymizing such data was successfully demonstrated in 2015. Right. You can try and anonymize all you want, but uh, there's always a trace back to the initial uh, source of that information. Although Gould said the NH NHSX app would auto-delete contact data that isn't uploaded to the government servers, he did explain, if data has been shared by choice, <laughs> with the NHS, then it can be retained for research in the public interest or by the NHS for planning and delivering services. Yes, they're going to come service you. Bend over. You're about to get serviced. Uh, <laughs> or by the NHS for planning and delivering services. Yes, they will be delivering those services directly to you. Obviously, in line with the law and uh, on the basis of necessary approvals by law. Oh. Yeah, baby! <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> now, let's say, yes, yes, exactly, Vinny, being serviced is being sodomized. Uh, and they love to sodomize everybody. So let's say you're one of those people that didn't like being locked down inside your home. Say, hey, this is, this is, this is false imprisonment. What are you doing? You've destroyed my business. You've destroyed my livelihood. I don't like it. I'm going out on the street and I'm going to protest. I'm going to carry a sign. Now, this is before all the George Floyd stuff. Before those protests were a-okay. Uh, there was these other protests going on out there. People protesting the coronavirus lockdowns. Well, from BigLeaguePolitics.com, <laughs> Deep State profiles coronavirus protesters as domestic terrorists warns of violence from anti-quarantine demonstrators. This is the new war on terror. Yes, indeed, you don't like being locked in your homes, uh, everybody being imprisoned in their homes. Too bad, so sad, you're now a terrorist. <laughs> the deep state is demonizing protesters who are taking to the streets because their livelihoods are being destroyed as a domestic terrorist threat. You there, making sandwiches in that deli, you're a terrorist. You over there, cutting that guy's hair, you're a terrorist. You there, just walking down the street with your dog, you're a terrorist. The federal government is warning so-called essential workers and government bureaucrats that they may be targeted by anti-quarantine demonstrators with violent attacks. But they were sad about that. They didn't get the violent attacks from anti-quarantine people. So they created a new whole mess. Again, we're not getting into George Floyd today, but you saw where it went being where we are today. The feds have transitioned from focusing on ISIS and al-Qaeda, uh, or, or ISIS, I should say, and al-Qaeda, to profiling freedom lovers and fighting their war on terror. Some illicit actors probably will view any continue, continued state-mandated manda orders as government overreach, and rightfully so and anticipated safety guidelines and policies, specifically the use of face masks, probably also will serve as a driving factor 
Uh, you mean because the face masks are absolutely freaking useless? Oh, yeah. The ones that you said were useless and not to use initially and for several weeks into it before you decided, hey, wait a minute, face masks are great. Let me sidebar here for a moment before I go on with this. <laughs> because although not connected to any of this and really several many years old, totally relevant to the situation. <laughs> if you're familiar with Far Side, the comic, the Far Side comic that used to come out, uh, Gary Larson uh, bit, <laughs> one, one, one thing that he did, well, one comic that he did was, it was there was these bears in a, in a cage and a guy with a chair and a whip. And, and so he was, you know, doing, having the bears do tricks for him because he was, you know, a guy at a circus with, with, these, uh, with these bears. And this one bear in the back, you see him unsnapping the snap on the side of his face, face mask, uh, is the, the little um, um, musk, or what do you, what do you call it? Um, <laughs> muff, muffs they put on their on their face so they can't bite you. I forget the exact word. Uh, my brain's just not doing 100% here today. Anyway, so he snaps it off, and he's looking at it in his hand, and he looks at the other bears, and he says, Hey, these things just snap right off. Muzzle. Thank you, Cowboy Tech. And the other bears are looking at him. Oh, and, and <laughs> hey, these things just snap right off. We're only muzzled because we're allowing it to happen. <laughs> anyway, going back to this. So, uh, specifically, the use of face masks probably also serve as a driving factor behind continued violent incidents related to the pandemic. Related to the planned pandemic. Analysts with the Department of Homeland Security wrote in their assessment. That's what the Homeland Security thinks. Protesters have been demonized because they have demonstrated their Second Amendment rights at, at anti-lockdown rallies across the country. However, and their First Amendment rights and their Fourth Amendment rights and, well, whatever. Uh, the, the actual instances of violence have come from, you guessed it, the authorita enforcing the draconian policies. The violence never came from the protesters. It came from the authorita. Uh, yes, and their draconian policies instituted primarily by Democrat governors across the nation. <laughs> yeah, one woman was dragged out of the Michigan Capitol for attempting to report on the legislator suffering horrible injuries and having PTSD-induced panic attack in the process. Uh, yeah, when the violence is initiated, it almost always, not 100%, but almost always comes at the hand of the authorita. Hmm. I may I may run over today. I'm I'm I've been I've been rambling on. I may run over. All right. So let's say you're a, a, a medical researcher of some kind, and you have have a have a formula almost developed which will absolutely kill Corona. It will absolutely kill Corona. And you tell people, your, your, your research partners, hey, hey, look what I got here. This is wonderful. Well, I'm going to suggest you don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody of what you're up to. Because you're going to wind up like this guy. ZeroHedge.com, May 6, 2020. Researcher on the cusp of Corona Breakthrough killed in bizarre murder-suicide. <laughs> experts oh no <laughs> All right. uh, the, the University of Pittsburgh researcher working on a coronavirus project was fatally shot on Saturday at his home in Ross Township while assisting how Gu uh, 46 was found dead in a car approximately 100 yards away of what appeared to be a self-inflicted gunshot the researcher 37 year old Bing Lu was found shot multiple times in the head, neck, and torso. 
around noon on Saturday. Nothing was stolen from the townhouse, and there was no forced entry, according to the Post-Gazette. He worked in the college's Department of Computational and Systems Biology at the Pitt School of Medicine. Bing was on the verge of making significant findings towards understanding the cellular mechanisms that underlie SARS-CoV-2 infection and the cellular basis of the following complications. The department was uh, announced in a written statement adding, we will make an effort to complete what he started in an effort to pay homage to his scientific excellence. Lou's expertise was developing computational models, simulation, and analysis techniques to study the dynamics of biological systems. And he just kind of, he just kind of died there. He just kind of died there. Yeah. That, that, it's not been solved. That, that murder or suicide, well, we'll just write it off to suicide. I want to get to this other one. Yeah, let me get to this one before I get to that one. Let me slide this over. So it'll be a slightly out of order in the blog, but don't worry about that. <laughs> I wonder if this this has anything to do with that. <laughs> on mintpressnews.com. Uh, is there a data? I don't see a data on here. Oh, there it is. May 4th. Okay. United States government fears China will give away corona vaccine for free. The United States government is afraid that China will develop and give away the vaccine for free. How horrible. What a, what a terrible group of people giving away a vaccine for free. The coronavirus pandemic is a clear instance in which the whole world shares a common interest in developing and distributing a vaccine, according to Dr. Dean Baker. This article is by Alan McLeod. The number of official global, vir global coronavirus mortalities surpassed a quarter of a million people today. That was, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's 400,000 now, uh, including over 69,000 in the U.S., which I think is 110,000. Uh, polls show that the American people are extremely worried. They never polled me about it. Um, I'm not worried about contracting the coronavirus. Uh, I'm only worried about... Uh, the, the totalitarianism I spoke of in that first article. However, the government has a much bigger concern that if they find the corona vaccine, China will copy it and distribute it for free. So if the U.S. develops it, China will steal it and give it away. Oh, <laughs> to many, it will not be immediately clear why it would be a problem for a manufacturing superpower, home to 1.4 billion people, to inoculate itself and others, but the White House, to the White House, this would be stealing a potential American innovation. Biomedical research has long been the focus of theft, especially by the Chinese government. Or as some of those guys on the radio like to say, chai toms <laughs> and vaccines and treatments for corona are today's holy grail. Yeah, holy grail of cash in your pocket. Putting aside the commercial value, uh, which you should put aside the commercial value, since you created the damn virus in the first place. There would be a great geopolitical significance to being the first to develop a treatment or vaccine. We will use all the tools we have to safeguard American research. Why? Why do you want to safeguard it? Why don't you want it out there being given away for free? Why don't you want all your billions and trillions of dollars not to be go to your profit, but just to fix this problem that you started? The fact that intellectual property and the profits of the multinational pharmaceutical corporations are officially being put before saving lives, even during a pandemic threatening the entirety of humanity, was not mentioned by the New York Times, who discovered Demers' remarks. Oh, man. 
Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I just can't go on <laughs> with that. I just can't go on. <sighs> Man. All right. Now we get to this part here. What's going on here? Why is that, why is that covering up my thing? From, believe it or not, cracked.com. <laughs> and I've seen these articles before. Not this particular one. This one came out May 4th. Uh, so I haven't seen this exact one. Uh, but I've seen others on Cracked uh, about this exact topic. Conspiracies that are not theories. They happened. Yep. <laughs> Look, by and large, conspiracy theories are packed to the brim with certifiable nonsense, which I disagree with, but that's cracked for you. Cracked is a mainstream outlet. But you know, uh, maybe still go out and invest some tin foil in some tin foil and make a hat or two. Absolutely do that. I know they're doing it tongue in cheek, saying it that way, but I'm serious. You need a good tin foil hat. Because sometimes reality is actually worse than what crazy people could come up with. <laughs> All right. Uh, number 20. They start off at 20. The space shuttle had a secret purpose. Grabbing Soviet satellites out of orbit. The space shuttle up there in the sky. The military designed it to capture Soviet satellites and return them to D.C., Although the shuttle never fulfilled that goal, uh, the military connection meant launches remained classified. Oh, God. Number 19. A fake witness convinced America to launch the first Gulf War. Fake witness. False flag behind the first Gulf War. A girl known as Naraya testified about the situation in Kuwait and President Bush, one, uh, recounted her story at least ten times to justify invading Iraq. But Naraya was secretly the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter, and her testimony was written by a Kuwaiti group, a PR firm, and a California congressman. Number 18, MI6 faked a Palestinian, Palestinian terrorist attack to scare the Jews. Britain's feared mass Jewish migration to Israel would spark a war, so their spy agency blew up five empty ships in 1947 and 1948, claiming they were refugee vessels to scare Jews from immigrating. Number 17. This is um, a little timely. This is a little timely. Tesla's rate riot, race riot killed hundreds, but was covered up for decades. Pilots bombed black neighborhoods. 6,000 black residents were arrested, and a 35-block district was razed to the ground. But Tulsa... Did I say Tesla to begin with? Tulsa. <laughs> but Tulsa kept the whole thing secret for 80 years. Number 16... Bohemian Grove Gentlemen's Club performs rituals with a 30-foot owl idol. Indeed, they do. Members have included Presidents Bush, Nixon, and Reagan, and some of history's most influential deals began there, including the talks for the Manhattan Project. The sinister machinations take place in a frat atmosphere where drunk guys pee against the Base of a, of towering redwoods. Oh, they do a lot worse than that, let me tell you. All right, number 15. The House Committee on Un-American Activities was founded by a Soviet spy. Yes. <laughs> the Better Red Than Dead group was founded by a Soviet spy. The committee famous, famously targeted communists, but it originally hunted for fascists. Its founder, the New York rep Samuel Dick Stein, Dick Stein, that's his name, all right, secretly worked for the NKVD, the precursor to the KGB. He was never caught during his lifetime. He went on to serve on the New York State Supreme Court. Number 14. 
The KGB had agents in place to cut off power to all of New York State. Yes, if the Cold War turned hot, agents would hit infrastructure on the Delaware River to ravage the power grid. They had arms caches in place, smuggled in using illegal immigration routes and other targets, which included oil pipelines and dams. Number 13. Some of you probably know about this, but some of you don't. The Dalai Lama was on the CIA's payroll. <laughs> That's right, Frog. The Dalai Lama was on the CIA's payroll. The CIA spent, sent him and his supporters $1.7 million every year through, uh, throughout the 1960s. A whopping $180,000 annually was allocated for the Dalai Lama to use personally, which at that time was a lot of money. <laughs> Number 12. The United States turned grave robbing to turn to grave robbing to test their nukes fallout. Yes, they even stole dead infants. One mother gave birth to a stillborn baby in 1957, asked for the body, and was refused. Doctors had cut its legs off to hand them over for government testing. Number 11. The FBI infiltrated the civil rights movement to sabotage it. We don't want no, you got no civil rights. Agents destroyed the Black Panther Party through sparking violence against other activist groups, smear campaigns against other members, and outrage, outright targeted attacks. Uh, number 10. 5,000 Scientologists wiretapped and burgled government agencies in the 70s. Is that, is that, is that breaking wait, Is that breaking news? I thought that was common information. Yeah. Uh, the, they, they infiltrated 136 organizations, agencies, and foreign embassies. When all of this was discovered, the church denied it and kidnapped one of their own operatives to keep him from testifying. Yeah, Scientology's gotten uh, some strange directions. Uh, number nine. Nixon ordered his goons to kill a newspaper communist. <laughs> Yeah, he he dispatched G. Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt to off longtime adversary com columnist Jack Anderson. Ultimately, though, they were pulled off the assignment so they could instead break into the Watergate. <laughs> they should have kept on going after him. Oh, boy. Number eight. The military released 330,000 mosquitoes in Georgia in 1955. The aim of the operation was to find out how disease-spreading bugs would fare in military use. <laughs> Maybe they thought their enemies didn't have DEET. I don't know. But the military did really, and they've released a bunch more since then for other, other sinister purposes in various places. Number seven. The FBI tried to blackmail MLK into killing himself. When they discovered Martin Luther King was cheating on his wife, they sent him a letter threatening to expose his affair unless he turned to suicide. King guessed J. Edgar Hoover had written it, and in a Senate, and the Senate investigation later proved him right. Yeah, and he did not kill himself, uh, but the same group that tried to convince him did. All right, number six, the military sprayed San Francisco with bacteria in 1950. And uh, I think that bacteria is still growing in San Francisco. Within days, people got mysteriously sick. By November, a patient had died. Weird infections have cropped up in the Bay Area ever since. The doctors say the military germs may be the culprit. Yeah, well, the socialism is really the culprit up there, but... Yeah, military germs didn't help any. All right, number five. America forged papers for Nazis to recruit them for the space program. Also, I thought was commonly common information, common knowledge, but whatever. Uh, publicly, President Truman strictly banned war criminals, even as the country welcomed other German scientists. Uh, secretly, the military snuck unapologetic Strange love grade Nazis right in. Yeah, I thought that was common information. Number four. 
businessmen tried to overthrow FDR and install a dictatorship in 1933. Would that have been a bad thing? <laughs> well, well, uh, maybe not the dictator. The, the, the dictatorship would have been a bad thing, but uh, FDR oh, being overthrown would have been okay. Uh, the, the, the group allegedly included Senator Prescott Bush, imagine that, and the heads of Goodyear and Standard Oil. They tried to recruit M Marine Corps Major Smedley Butler uh, to lead a military coup. Smedley spilled the beans to a con congressional committee in 1934. Yes, he did. Uh, Smedley was all right for one of them. Number three. The government killed 10,000 people by poisoning their booze. Yes, during Prohibition, the government spiked industrial alcohol with poison to discourage illegal drinking. The deterrent failed, vastly under, underestimated uh, the people's desire to get uh, drunk. Number two, in the 1950s, over 400 journalists, uh, over 400 jur journalists, were actually secret CIA plants. And it's a lot more now. Uh, they included top-level employees from all three major networks, as well as the New York Times, Time, the AP. They slipped in pro-government slipped in pro-government stories and suppressed anything that was not government friendly. And number one. The KGB spread the idea that the CIA killed JFK. Well, they may not have been wrong. Uh, they, they forged a letter from Lee Harvey R. Oswald to the CIA and sent copies to conspiracy theorists in America. So there was a Kennedy conspiracy to spread Kennedy conspiracy theories. <laughs> not, uh, they, they may not, but I think there was a lot more people involved there. Then the CIA. I'm not done, man. I got more leftovers for you. <laughs> I know I'm out of time, but I still got more for you. Um, <laughs> uh, you got tomatoes? You got any tomatoes growing in your backyard? Be careful. May 10th, 2020. Heavily militarized SWAT raids, uh, <laughs> excuse me, that choked me up. Heavily militarized SWAT raids, innocent family for growing tomatoes, and taxpayers are held liable. This on blacklistednews.com. I'll try and summarize as best as possible. No, I'm good. I'm good, Chloe. <laughs> Le Leewood, Kansas. Adeline and Robert Hayes and their two children had harmed no one and broken none of their phony laws when heavily armed militarized SWAT deputies in the Johnson County Sheriff's Department stormed their homes like it was an ISIS compound. The hero deputies were searching for evidence of the devil's lettuce, the evil weed, marijuana production and use but they found none because the hearts they don't use or produce marijuana they do however grow vegetables and they also drink tea the hearts of their two children were held at gunpoint and nearly killed for purchasing supplies for their vegetables gardening and drinking tea and after they were seen buying gardening supplies Cops rummaged through their trash. Oh, look, they're buying gardening supplies. They're obviously weed heads. And so that cops rummaged through their trash and mistook tea leaves for weed. Now, if you're mista mistaken tea leaves for weed, you got no business busting anybody for weed. Sparking probable cause and the raid. Uh, since the raid in 2012, the Hart family has been attempting to seek justice but to no avail. This month, however, they finally got a break. <sighs> According to Reason, the couple whose home was raided in 2012, after sheriff deputies claimed the loose tea they found in the trash was marijuana, will receive $150,000 for their trouble under a settlement agreement 
with the Johnson County Sheriff's Office. The settlement, which capped seven years of litigation, including two trips to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, falls far short of the $7 million that Adlin and Robert Hart originally sought, but it represents an implicit acknowledgement that the Harts and their children suffered an outrageous invasion of their privacy and dignity in the service of a comically inept public stunt. <laughs> They're growing a plant. Let's murderize them. Corona. Oh, you gotta love the innovation coming about due to Corona. And I really like this product. I mean, it makes so much sense. <laughs> this is posted on SputnikNews.com on the uh, 10th of May. Colombian, Colombian company designs a hospital bed that turns into a coffin amid corona spread. Oh boy, that's so handy. That's terrific. <laughs> the South American country has a relatively small number of corona cases uh, and deaths compared with Europe and the West, but the pandemic has already put pressure on the nation's healthcare funerals and funeral systems. Colombian company ABC displays uh, has designed a hospital bed that can be transformed into a coffin amid the news of shortages caused by corona planned demic. Uh, the, the Associated Press reported the bed is made of cardboard and has metal handles on the sides. It can hold up to 330 pounds, so even you big boys out there... <laughs> The company's director, Rodolfo Gomez, says he came up with the idea after hearing news about the events in neighboring Ecuador. Uh, you know, I, I don't care what you say. The, the, just, if they put you on one of these beds, if they put you on one of these beds that turn into a coffin, you better get your goodbyes out of the way. Because you ain't coming back. <laughs> You're not getting off that bed. You are, uh, <laughs> that, that bed is your death and burial bed. Oh, boy. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> now, I don't know how true this is or not, but I saw it, and I thought it was hilarious. It's posted up here on the New York Post. And I, I can believe it, because, well, these people, uh, social media bozos are now peeing their pants out of lockdown boredom. This is posted on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. You're in the club. Just in case you thought the coronavirus stay-at-home challenge couldn't get any grosser, bored isolationists are now posting TikTok videos of themselves peeing their own pants. The Pee Your Pants Challenge hashtag currently boasts 3.9 million views on TikTok with dozens of clout-chasing chuckleheads heeding nature's call on camera to keep entertained amid lockdown. In the original clip posted on April 21st, 19-year-old comedian Liam Weyer uh, can be seen in front of a mirror nonchalantly announcing the perverse prank's name before a revolting trickling sound can be heard in the background, followed by a wet spot appearing on the front of his sweatpants. Weyer, <laughs> who posted the video after it was... Uh, after it was taken, Yanks from TikTok told the insider, I'm surprised to see that people on the internet will pee themselves if you call it a challenge and add a hashtag. Needless to say, his viral video leak spawned hordes of imitators. One of the more popular clips, which holds almost 70,000 likes and 2 million on TikTok, 
show a urine enthusiast guffawing hysterically as in, and subsequently <coughs> moaning as the dirtiness of his deed dawns on him. Oh. <laughs> there, 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 there is a video. There is a video here of the dude peeing his pants. Should you desire to, to check that out? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> anyway, folks, that's going to wrap it up here for the Grim Leftovers for this week. Uh, yeah, I did go about 10 minutes over here, so sorry about that. But, uh, hey, it happens. I get carried away in a story or two, you know. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I'll be back again next week with Episode 76. And uh, uh, tomorrow at uh, 3, 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Eastern is the uh, In a Perfect World show with Flash and probably Grammy. We'll see what comes on. But check out, check that out, that show. Uh, check the schedule on RealLibertyMedia.com for all the rest of the shows that are on RLM Radio throughout the week uh, at RLMRadio.xyz uh, as well. And um, if you want to do a show, let me know. I'll, I'll get you hooked up. All right, talk to you all later. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been great. Peace.